Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Bright Ideas e-commerce podcast. As always, I'm your host, Trent Deersmith, and I'm here to help you discover what is working in e-commerce by shining a light on the tools, the tactics, and the strategies in use by today's leading entrepreneurs. Now, back in the prior episode, number 288, you heard how Mark Doust is helping entrepreneurs to buy and sell online businesses. And in today's episode, I'm joined by Colin McIntosh, founder and CEO of Sheets and Giggles, based in Denver. Sheets and Giggles, or S&G as they're referred to, is one of the fastest growing direct-to-consumer bedding brands in the U.S. Makers of sustainable premium eucalyptus, eucalyptus lyocell bed sheets, S&G launched with nearly $300,000 in a crowdfunding campaign in May of 2018. And then they won first place at a Denver Startup Week in 2018. They participated in Techstars Boulder for 2019, and they sold a million dollars worth of product in their first 12 months of sales. Before I welcome Colin to the show, just a very quick word from our sponsor for this particular episode, which is a company called Hrefs. So prior to discovering Hrefs, I was definitely not much of a fan of SEO. I thought it was too technical. I figured I was too late to the game and that I would never get any results. And as a result, I never really put any effort into it. Well, now that I've been using their tool for a few months, it has become a daily resource for SEO research and planning. For example, when I go to find a title for this episode, I'll be using that tool to figure out what keywords I should be targeting. So if you wanna know which keywords are driving traffic to a competitor's website, easy to find with Ahrefs. If you wanna know how to improve the ranking of your YouTube videos, also easy to do in Ahrefs. If you wanna easily perform detailed keyword research to identify important phrases that you should incorporate into your cornerstone content, again, very easy to do with Ahrefs. If you wanna see the most popular pages of a competitor's site, same thing, easy to do with Ahrefs. It is an amazing all-in-one SEO tool and it is useful for far more than just building backlinks. So if you wanna grow traffic to your website, Ahrefs has everything that you need in order to be able to do that. If you aren't using it yet, I would highly recommend you go check it out and you can sign up for a $7 trial on their website and that is at ahrefs.com. All right, Colin. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much for making some time. Yeah, thanks for having me here. And I feel like I got to go uh, get my marketing team to start using Ahrefs because I don't think we're, we're employing that just yet. So it sounds it, pretty good. It is pretty a, good uh, very compelling. It is a phenomenal tool. I, I literally do use it every single day. I can't oh. imagine not having it. A lot of my buddies use it and, and I, my companies in the past have used it. So it's one of the things that I think we're just too stretched too thin to, uh, but mm -hmm. you know, I'm all, uh, I gotta get back on that. I understand the concept of being stretched too thin. Trust me on that. So yeah. we're going to, we're going to do three parts yeah. in your interview today. We're going to talk about your company and how you got it started and products and sourcing and all that kind of stuff. Then we're going to transition and talk about marketing, how you're growing the business and then assuming that we have time, we're going to talk about your people and your process strategies. So let's dive into it. So we, we know your company sells sheets. And I know when we did the pre-interview, I said to you, really? Bed sheets on the internet? Like, yeah. why? Yeah, it's sexy, right? It's, um, yeah, sexier than B2B SaaS. Um, you know, so uh, basically, I had a wearable tech company that I was on the founding team and uh, ran and biz dev for, um, but I wasn't the CEO, I wasn't uh, on the board or anything like that. And so uh, I learned a lot of tough lessons with that uh, in terms of go-to-market strategy, supply chain management, um, you know, philosophically when you should go to physical retail versus focus on the more online channels. And so I was really, um, you know, when I, when I kind of left that company, um, I really wanted to do my own thing. And so I knew I needed a physical product um, I knew that I wanted it to be a sustainable product because I'm big on sustainability. I wanted it to be something that was largely traditionally physical retail that I could help bring online with a direct to consumer uh, play. And then I also wanted something that was in a massive, highly fragmented commodities market with zero brand differentiation or loyalty. Mm -hmm. And that was literally exact. I wrote it out on a piece of paper, the exact business model I wanted to build. Um, and I also wanted a lower complexity supply chain than, you know, wearable tech, which had dozens of components across a bunch of countries. Um, 
And so I looked at all my criteria and then this is the honest to God's truth. I looked at all of the uh, domain names that I own and I own sheetsgiggles.com. And I thought to myself, does betting fit my criteria? And it fit it perfectly. So for me, it was a lot of the opposite of like what most founders will do where they see a problem, build a solution and then try to build a business out of that. I mm -hmm. built a business model that I was very passionate about and then created a product that plugged into that model. So walk me through some of the aspects of the early research that you did to figure out, you know, hey, should I go all in charging down the road after this particular product line in this particular market category? Yeah. So that's another thing that I think I did slightly differently than a lot of other founders that I see. Um, a lot of times people will go full bore towards building a product that they have in their mind's eye or they patented um, or the, sometimes we'll even get to the point where they're creating thousands of units of inventory before they've ever tested the market or done the hard work of sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. For me, it was very much the opposite. I basically, I, you know, I was having manufacturing meetings. I was doing a ton of research and product development and, you know, thinking about what the product would be without spending any significant capital on that end. Um, just meeting with people and hiring a few contractors to do some initial designs. Um, and then on the, on the same time, I was uh, doing photo shoots and video shoots and content creation and launching a website for very little money, less than you know $1,000 I think I spent getting everything set up um, mm -hmm. on the site with our photography and our copy and content, which I wrote myself. And then um, we basically ran about $1,000 worth of Facebook ads uh, to about, we had like 50 different ad variants, 12 different landing page variants, different headers, different calls to action, different images, um, different verbiage in, in the copy paragraphs. And we, the first week that we ran ads, we captured emails and this is ahead of a crowdfund, right? So the, the value prop people was, Hey, give us your email to lock in at this price for this really premium product. Um, and it was just kind of testing the brand and people's reaction to the brand that we wanted to build, um, see if people would resonate with the idea of sustainable bed sheets from a funny company, which is a weird pitch. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, we ended up capturing emails at a 34% clip that very first week. Um, and that was very high for email capture, um, especially ahead of a crowd fund. And so we were able to extrapolate out our eventual cost per lead by saying, okay, if we improve our capture from here, which we hope that we can, and if we have this cost per click, we have this resulting cost per lead, we'll wind up having, you know, X thousand emails at Y thousand dollars. And then, you know, an email list reasonably converts at 3%. This is what we think our day one customers are going to be. This is the size of the crowdfunding campaign we think it will translate into. Um, and we could basically work our way backwards to figure out what our cost of acquisition was going to be from that very first week that we were running email capture ads. Um, and it held true almost to the dollar. Uh, and so that was really cool. And that was the, that was the first moment where I, where I realized that the unit economics actually really could work on this. That is fascinating. So I want to, I want to actually go down that rabbit hole a sure. little further. So let's walk us through that. Um, so you put up a landing page that basically said what? Just, just describe <laughs> the landing page for us. Well, we said uh, these are, so I think that any new product launch needs three core value props um, in order to differentiate yourself from the existing options on the market. So ours were, it's literally, the eucalyptus is literally softer than cotton um, and more breathable and cooling, just a better product overall. And I wanted to lead okay. with that because I didn't think that leading with the sustainability was the right call. Cause I think that when you're intrinsically, when you're telling somebody that it's sustainable as the first value prop, you're telling them it's not as good as the unsustainable option. And that's just not, not true here. Yeah. Um, so and you had, you had not prop, made it, you had not made any product yet. You hadn't sourced any no. product. You hadn't lined up. You just knew that you could make sheets out of eucalyptus. Material research. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we, right. so we had done material research. We had done initial tech packs where, you know, we, we did our specifications for what we wanted the sheets to look like and colors and lab dips. And, you know, we had done research on sizing preferences. So like we knew what we were going to do. Um, but I hadn't committed to anything at this point. And you say, um, and and you, sorry that, to interrupt, but you say the word we, did no, you, no. Do you have a, do you have a co-founder or is we the euphemism for you? Uh, we is the Royal we, so, uh, me, uh, but, so, <laughs> but it was, it was me. And then I had, uh, contractors, um, that were helping on the marketing and product side. 
Um, you know, but I didn't commit to anything until we ran these initial ads. Okay. Um, and so I basically, we, I had, I, I keep saying we, um, I did have a digital marketing agency, a guy named Will Russell, who I love to death. Uh, we just parted ways after 18 months of working together because it just outgrew, uh, that type of early stage agency. Um, but he was my spiritual co-founder, um, and he helped with the crowd fund. So, uh, we were putting these ads together, together. Um, and then what we did was we used Shopify to build our initial site. We used kickoff labs in order to build our initial landing pages. Uh, we used Facebook native ad tools in order to, uh, target lookalike audiences for early adopters and the landing pages. Like you said, they all said, Hey, these are softer than cotton. These are sustainable. And these are going to cost $69 on the Indiegogo, which I thought was a funny price for bed sheets, but nobody, nobody saw that. Out. <laughs> Uh, and, and, uh, it's going to cost $69 for bed sheets on the Indiegogo. Uh, normal retail price is going to be a hundred. Ended up underpricing that actually. We, we now sell our King sheets for 150. Um, so the people that bought a 69 got a freaking steal. So, um, so the value from so we, the ethical bribe, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. The ethical bribe for the landing page was, Hey, give us your email address. And in doing so, we promise that when we do the our Indiegogo, you're going to get first kick at the can to be able to buy these things that you seem to want for 69 bucks instead of, you know, whatever they're going to sell for retail. Okay. So, right, and we had a comp, we had, and we had a comparable product to Bed Bath & Beyond that they were selling for 180 for a King, their eucalyptus option. And so basically we were like, here's like the price difference in the comparable sheet sets is massive for what you're getting for this value prop. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about the Facebook ads. You said you targeted lookalike audiences, but if you didn't have an email address and you didn't have any pixels yet, how did you target a lookalike audience? Like how did you do the targeting on Facebook? So that was, that was where Will came into play. And so Will had done other uh, crowdfunding campaigns for other folks before and so he was able to use his list of, uh, you know, look like audiences from earlier crowdfunding campaigns in order to identify early adopters and innovators, people that like backing Kickstarters and Indiegogos. Um, so it was a very, it was a very warm audience. Ah, clever. And, and, that, clever. and, and that's the, that's the value, by the way, for anybody going to do a crowdfund, that's the value of hiring an agency is that they've done this before. So they've got these kind of built in email lists. And to be clear, do not contact those people that are already on their email list or past campaigns. It's more of using their Facebook tokens, which they've consented to and opted into by sharing their information with these other companies that the agency has worked with um, in order to say, hey, you might also like this other yeah. new crowdfunding campaign that's happening. Yeah. Um, and so Facebook ads work. Um, they, you know, that's all I can say is that they, they convert. Um, and we were kind of, after that first week, we felt really good. And over eight weeks ahead of our crowdfund, we ended up capturing 11,000 emails of people that were giving us their emails. And we were capturing those at a 45% rate, um, which was insane, uh, for me to see that literally one out of every two people that was hitting our landing page was giving us their email. Um, what, what was your cost? What was your cost per email address in, in dollars or cents? Eight, 89 cents. 89. Okay. Cause I remember yeah, cents. testing something okay. using yeah. a, the contest strategy and I was getting them for 32 cents. So I'm always just curious. It, it, honestly, it's, ca it's category by category. Um, and it's, I know people that have gotten them for 35 cents, 30 cents. Like you said, I know people that are paying $2, $5 per email. Um, depends on item price value prop. If you're doing a social sharing piece and you have this yeah. organic, yeah. uh, kind of, like you said, this, this waterfall effect. Um, we did have a social sharing option that accounted for 15% of our emails. People were sharing and, and trying to do a contest to win a free set of sheets. Um, and so that was, uh, definitely part of it, but, um, overall, I mean, 90 cent cost per email, uh, email list converts at 3%, let's say then you need 30 emails, 33 emails in order to guarantee yourself, uh, you know, a single sale. And so basically you can say, okay, my cost of acquisition is going to be about $30 from this email list. And then you can kind of build into their, uh, your margin and see if you're actually going to, going to wind up making money. And that's just your paid acquisition. That's in order to snowball on day one and actually reach the front page of Indiegogo or Kickstarter where where then a ton of people are going to discover you for free. Um, mm -hmm. And so the email list is really a crucial tool on day one of a crowd fund to let's say I have 11,000 emails that should translate into, if I'm doing things right, 300 ish customers at a 30% conversion flip. 
a 3% conversion clip or maybe mm -hmm. 400 at 4%, 200 at 2%. Mm -hmm. I'm going gangbusters, 500 at 5%. Um, and so that, you know, multiplied by a hundred dollar average order value is going to yield anything from 30 to $50,000 on day one uh, of the crowdfund. And that is going to put you on the front page of Indiegogo and Kickstarter. And that's exactly what happened. We did 45,000 on day one and we're the number two trending product. Damn, dude, I love how you went at this with pure mathematics conversion rate assumptions. I think that is absolutely uh, a brilliant way to do this. How did you learn how to do that? Um, well, I used to be an SAT tutor. Uh, so I love uh, just quick, uh, you know, I, I love directional decision making where it's like this number points here. Um, I think I, I I've always been really good. I went to Emory University. I majored in finance, econ. I love uh, numbers. Worked at um, the world's largest hedge fund called Bridgewater Associates. Oh, you uh, worked at Bridgewater? Months, yeah, yeah. I got fired oh, in five man. months. Oh, man. They didn't, they, didn't, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't teach me much. I'm, uh, a big fan of, <laughs> I'm a big fan of Ray Dalio. That guy, I, I like the principles. Yeah, yeah. I, the principles are, are great. Um, I, could, I could talk to you offline about that a little bit more. Um, but, you know, I... I Bridgewater for what it was is a really interesting place to start my career. A lot of stuff stuck with me um, yeah. in terms of being direct, honest, uh, transparent, uh, you know, and so that, you know, I, I think that the problem solving actually um, is one of the things that stuck with me the most from Bridgewater about kind of, is it the people or the machine that are the problem? And then if you can identify, well, that it's not the people, then you have to change the system. But if you can identify that the system should be sound with the right inputs, then you got to figure that, okay, maybe I have a people problem. So there's, there's all sorts of stuff that I learned from that. But I think the, on the crowdfunding side, it was just reading different resources, understanding what it takes to have a successful crowdfund. Generally speaking, you want 30% of your overall internal goal to come in on day one um, mm -hmm. or, day, or at least by day two. And so if you want to do a $100,000 campaign, you've got to do 30 grand on day one. And if you have a hundred dollar average order value, that's 300 customers. And if you have 300 customers, then you need a 10,000 person email list. And that's at 3%. That's yeah, so which is kind of working. Yeah. It's pretty simple people. math. When you, when you work backwards, it's yeah. pretty simple math because now you can figure out, okay, so if I'm going to spend X to acquire that email list and I'm going to sell 50 grand worth of product, given the margin that I perceive I'm going to have on the product, you can see if, if one is going to pay for the other. And I'm assuming in your case, the crowdfund was a profitable event or was it break even? It was, it was just about break even. I would say it might, might've been slightly unprofitable um, in the long run, but the important thing about, cause we did, you know, we had a defect rate on our first shipments, a uh, thousand, you know, we sent out 10,000 units and I think like 6% or more of them were defective. It was awful. Um, and so, you know, replacing those and managing those mm -hmm. customer expectations and that sort of thing. Um, you know, that was really uh, a hard, it's a hard time and a hard experience for us. But so, you know, I think on the end of the day, we'd lost money. Um, but the major thing about the 284 that we ended up raising was that it was the largest Indiegogo ever for bed sheets. Um, and there were, that's a funny qualifier. I know like how many bed sheets. <laughs> you're Indiegogo? probably the only uh, one with bed sheets. It's, it's funny. Uh, but no, well, it's a, that's what people think. But no, there were, there were two others that launched on the same day as us actually. Really? Um, and, okay. and one of them, yeah. And one of them raised 15,000 and the other raised 50, 50,000. So we blew them both out of the water. Um, I attribute that entirely to the brand. Um, and so, you know, the, in our preparation, uh, and so the, the biggest thing with that was that it got the attention of a lot of folks in Colorado, uh, which is where we're based. And, uh, you know, I ended up, uh, applying to pitch at Denver startup week in September of that year. The crowdfund ended in June. I went to India right after that, made sure that our, our manufacturers were on pace, uh, to hit our timelines of shipping. Um, I ended up winning first place at Denver startup week in September. There were investors in the crowd, um, who ended up, uh, you know, investing in the company. We ended up raising, uh, a small seed, a pre-seed round at the end of last year. And then that also happened to be where we met with Techstars, um, who asked us to come to, uh, you know, or apply to the Techstars Boulder program in 2019, uh, which we did from January through April. So really it's. It's like the type of, 
it's the type of story where it's like just one thing leads to another and you always have to be saying yes to every opportunity mm -hmm. and that's a lot of travel it's very little sleep it's a lot of getting in front of a crowd and and hawking your wares um but you know it's it's definitely something that i think is uh why i've been able to to grow so fast it's just how how often i do things <laughs> So you were, to, to summarize this first bit of our conversation, Colin, you were able to validate your business idea to a high degree of certainty for about 11 grand. Um, yes. Um, and was, and, and, was, well, and I, I would say that we validated it in the first two grand or three grand because the first week where we spent $1,000 on the ads, our, our email conversion rate was like 35%. And that was even right. going to be good enough to, to go for it. Yeah. Um, and then that was when I turned on the gas and tapped into my personal savings um, and to some friends and family money, spent about 10 more grand of preparation, like you said, to get the 11,000. But now you've got, but now you've got data and you've got yeah. a story of how you're going to say, this is how my data that I've accumulated in the first two or three days is going to actually convert into revenue going forward. Correct. And so you did 300,000 in your crowdfunding campaign, but about 50,000 of that, I think you said came from your email list. So the rest came from getting on the front page of Indiegogo. Is that right? Um, I would say it was a number of things. We, so we, so we did uh, definitely at least 50 grand from our own email list. Actually, probably more than that because we hit them back up for duvet cover add-ons, pillowcase add-ons. Uh, we launched comforters during the campaign. Um, and so I think all in all, the email list might have been closer to like 75 or 80 or around there. And then I think another chunk of about 90 came from Indiegogo discoverability um you know being on the front page being in their newsletters um and then i think the remaining 100 or so was us we were running facebook ads throughout the campaign uh and mm -hmm. so we were spending money on facebook ads throughout the campaign driving people to uh our indiegogo landing page yep 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 yep, yep. okay i'll tell you i've interviewed a lot of folks a lot of folks here on my show over the years hundreds of them and your launch strategy is probably either first or second in terms of clever of how you, you launched your business early on. It's a really um, nice compliment. I, you've done two, 288 of these. So it's yeah, I've been at it a while. <laughs> I, no, I mean, that means a lot. That means a lot. I appreciate that. It, it was honest to God. It was born out of a lot of heartbreak um and pain from my last company you know i got laid off uh monday at 1 p.m uh and we all did um and so that was really hard because i had written that business plan when i was you know 23 year old kid for that last company and saw us raise millions of dollars and we had 30 people working in downtown denver and we were in target and brookstone and hsn qvc like we had a lot of great stuff going and it just ended up not working for a number of reasons, but that was, I was sick to my stomach. Um, and three weeks later I found that S and G, um, trying to take those lessons and, and be a little more methodical, um, with, with my own company. Yeah. Yeah. Well, indeed you were. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the product because obviously, um, if you, if you're a great marketer, but your product is crap or your margins aren't sufficient, you're not going to go very far. So, yeah. uh, gross margins on, betting what does it look like so so well so this is actually this is our packaging um and so it's designed entirely for a direct-to-consumer unboxing experience you see it's nice and it's dimensionally not too massive um mm -hmm. this is actually our new throw blanket so it's not actually our sheets but this is our new throw blanket you can see right when you open it it says sheets and giggles sheet yeah social call to action <laughs> top sheet at sheets giggles and then you know you got the wrap tag and the wrap tag is like very Oh, fell right up. So the wrap tag is very cheeky in the sense of, you know, it says, uh, I suggest activities, play with puppies, sleep in, um, yeah. movie night. I love it. And we get, we get a lot of folks that, yeah, tag us right away. And um, this is the, the throw blanket that we just launched, also eucalyptus. Um, and then the sheets also have an eye mask um, and a few other things in there. But I'm glad you brought the product because I completely agree with you that the marketing is what gets the first sale and then product and customer service is what gets every sale after that. And you cannot exist without the last two. Yeah. 
All right. So again, going back to gross margins, doing all of that extra stuff that you've done, what impact yeah. did that have and how does that translate into a gross margin? Um, gross margins for us, I mean, so manufacturing margin, gross margin, net margin, and um, we always try to stay above um, 20% net margin uh, all in. Um, and so that includes uh, COGS, it includes uh, marketing costs, return rate, uh, it includes shipping, logistics, 3PL, freight, duties. Um, we plant a tree for every order, so that's uh, about 1% margin share every order we plant a tree. Um, and so uh, that all works into, uh, I always try to keep it above 20%. Now, of course, the largest variable component of that is going to be your marketing cost because your cogs are effectively set until you hit a certain amount of scale. Um, you know, you've got your duties and freight and 3PL and FedEx fees, which are fairly set. Uh, and then you also have your return rate, which I wouldn't say is out of your control, but it's partially out of your control. And so the number one thing in that variable cost structure is going to be your cost of acquisition. And so uh, generally speaking, if we can't hit above a 20% net margin, uh, we tend to turn down the advertising spend, revamp, see what's going on, and then move forward from there. Um, and we have taken a little bit of investment money, so we can't, we don't have the luxury of like going totally dark for a month to try to fix things. Mm -hmm. But I have set the expectation with our investors that that's the way I want to run the company is profitable first and scalable second. Um, and so uh, I'm glad that I set that expectation because it gives us leeway to figure out problems when they arise. How much money did you raise? We just closed a $1.3 million financing round in, uh, we announced it in August. Um, and so that was a pure growth round opportunity round. Uh, How much did you have to give net, up? Net economics. How um, much did... that's, that's going to have to stay private, unfortunately, cause that's not, okay. that's not disclosed, uh, on crunch base or anything. But, um, I think the terms were super reasonable. Um, mm -hmm. you know, for the most part, uh, me and my lead investor set them hand in hand where we came to an agreement pretty early on on what everything would look like. And how'd you, um, uh, how'd you raise it? Round. How did you raise it? Um, well, we came out of Techstars in late April. Uh, and Techstars is just, I can't recommend that enough for people to apply to that with a, a young startup. Um, and we came out with a head of steam. We were on stage at Demo Day. Uh, and, you know, we were, uh, I'm kind of a ham on stage. So I had the audience laughing and rolling and uh, like five minute pitch. And the, the feeling I wanted people in the room to leave with, and they were mostly, a lot of them were investors, like a thousand person audience. Um, was how could I have missed this company? Um, or like, whole, you know, holy shit, like a bed sheets company is like the most impressive company on stage at Techstars this year. <laughs> um, and that was, you know, like that was, that was what I wanted in the field. And so, um, you know, we really, we, we played up the traction, you know, I think in, so in January we did 63 K in sales, February 53, March 75, April 123. Um, and then you're talking year, orders, number of orders, no re uh, revenue, uh, oh, okay. uh, thousands of dollars. Okay. Yeah. That, sorry. 63,000, 53,000, 75,000, 123,000. And then in May we did over 150. So we had this really nice yeah. day curve for the, for the first five months of the year. And I got on stage and I was very transparent. I was like, here's what we're doing. Here's our net margins. Here's our cost of acquisition. Here's, you know, our repeat buy rates, return rates, everything, every metric down to the second decimal place. And that type of transparency basically I allowed people to, to, yeah. And it basically allowed people in the room to be like, all right, like, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a visionary pitch. It wasn't like a, here's an idea or, you know, here's our early traction. It was just very, very, here's our net margin. If we pour this much money into marketing, it'll three X our trajectory. I would like to do that. Um, let me know if you're interested in doing that. And like, and you know, it was, uh, it was, I think we closed it around in like six or eight weeks. Uh, it was really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and that was very, I feel very grateful for that. Cause I know that it won't always be <laughs> that fast. Um, yeah. but, uh, but yeah. And so we, we just had a lot of community connections. Most of the money's Colorado money. We've got some angel investors in New York and San Francisco and a few other places, but, I stayed away for the most part from institutional money because a lot of the expectations are 
20, 30, 40 X or bust. Yeah. Um, and I really don't like that from a, a business model perspective. Obviously it puts an extremely high strain on the company, increases risk of failure, increases failure points. And then B, I just don't, that's not my vision for this company. I want to have a company that allows me to be free and independent. Um, and you can't do that if you've got a mm -hmm. board of directors that you're, that are hawking over you, that are asking you why you're not growing, you know, 10 X uh, every quarter. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, so we, that we, luckily all my investors are on the same page as me and um, I've pitched this as like a good business to invest in if you want a, a triple and not necessarily a home run, which is an odd pitch for a founder, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we're now going to transition to marketing because now that you've, mm -hmm. you know, you've validated your idea, you've raised $1.3 million and now you got to grow the thing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, you've been at this now, have you, have you completed two full years of revenue? As of last weekend, two years since founding, but 18 months since pre-sale on um, Indiegogo and only one year since we started shipping and recognizing revenue. Okay. So if you had to, um, I was going to ask you your year over year growth rate, but you don't have two years yet, but you've got a run rate. So yeah. What, what, what does that look like? The growth, the year over year growth rate on your run rate. So sub, September this year was about six to seven X to September of last year. Okay. Um, and then uh, we're forecasting that November, December are going to be combined about four to five X last year. So overall, we're on like a, a 4X type year over year growth trajectory from 2018 to 2019. Mm -hmm. But the monthly, the monthly revenues are, um, are significantly more than the corresponding months last year, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and, and you're doing this. So, so yeah, I would say about four to five X overall. And you're doing this. Prof yes. Yeah. Prof prof yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've, we burned extremely little cash uh, since the round closed uh, four months ago. So the yeah. money's pretty much just still sitting there. <laughs> Which is, you know, it, sitting there is maybe the wrong term. Biding its time. The money's biding its time. Where, you know, it, it, for me, we're, we're a sheet company. So while gifting season is definitely like, and we're on Amazon now. So like there's going to be Black Friday opportunities and other, other stuff that are just going to go bananas. Um, so while the gifting season, we're going to see a bump for sure. Um, and for everybody listening, I would encourage you to give the sheetiest gift ever this year and, uh, <laughs> give somebody a box, box full of sheet. Uh, uh, you know, the, it's kind of a fool's errand for us to bump our ad budgets in November, December, especially during political seasons, um, in November. Um, and then basically, uh, you know, compete with all those higher uh, CPMs. And so yeah. we're going to basically wait till Jan January, February to turn on the spend and, and ride that uh, downswing in CPM since we have an evergreen product. Yeah, absolutely. Although I would imagine, you know, people are going to give sheets as a gift. So, and that's one of the reasons we introduced the throw blanket, which is $39 price point um, yeah. versus the hundred dollar plus price point for the sheets is I think this is a lovely, lovely gift. Um, and it's like a really, it's a really premium gift. I think that we should charge 80 bucks for this, but I wanted to blow it out and be more competitive with fleece blankets out there. Um, by the way, that something interesting in terms of marketing and product development is that, I don't know if your audience is familiar with um, some tools that can tell you like Amazon relative search frequency. Um, but one of the reasons we launched a throw blanket is because it's like search term frequency number like 159 on Amazon, which is enormous. Clean, clean sheets is like 500 or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so this product for me was like a no brainer because the search volume is so tremendous and all the major players are selling at 25, 29 bucks. And so I don't think a $39 product is that crazy when you're talking about the quality and sustainability difference in it. And so this is also a, an entry level kind of lead gen for people to discover our yeah. utility fabric in in mass on amazon in a much higher search volume category so you mentioned tools and you mentioned the phrase search term frequency so i live in a world of just doing keyword research i use tools like viral launch a lot of the times where you know I'll i love i love viral launch you guys they were great 
Yeah. So is, is that the tool when you, when you talk about search term frequency, is that one of the tools that you're using to discover that? that is not or the tool. I'm, else? I'm using Amazon's native tools inside of Seller Central. Um, and so I did look at Viral Launch, really great guys. I think that we'll probably use them in the future, um, but I wanted to stick with them. Amazon's native tools for a little while longer. So you're able to see really awesome data on Amazon nowadays about search frequency, um, put through share, conversion share. It's pretty nifty. Okay. I'm just typing a note here for the show notes. All right. Uh, these days, so now that you're on Amazon, has it become the dominant channel? Are you getting most of your new customers or I should say orders because you're not getting customers from Amazon. You're just getting orders. True. There's a big um, there is a big difference. Uh, it's month by month. So, uh, you know, July, Amazon beat the website. August and September, the website beat Amazon. Uh, I think that no October, Amazon will win. November and December, I would have to assume that Amazon will win mm -hmm. um, because of the urgency of, of timelines for orders, you know, uh, for Amazon Prime. Uh, and the placements that we're doing with Amazon, you know, we're doing some, some cool uh, marketing stuff with them. Um, I was actually um, just at a great event with Amazon in New York uh, where they, you know, hosted this small business, um, you know, shout out to them, small business holiday spotlight. It was really cool. They got a bunch of press in the room, picked some businesses that they really like, some small businesses. And uh, we were able to meet people that I would have never been able to meet just on my own, um, mm -hmm. give them the products, literally pass them into their hands. Um, and it was, this is literally just last night. Uh, Amazon's such a terrific partner in so many ways. And then of course the double-edged sword is that you're not getting customer, right? You're getting the order. Mm -hmm. um, now I think that there's certain things for startups to be able to get around that and be slightly um, more creative. Uh, so like the packaging, right? It should always be a vehicle to drive people to your website um, and to your um, your email list if possible. Um, now, of course, you have to stay within Amazon's terms of service and make sure that you're not doing anything on board. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, we have different stuff in here that will uh, make people want to discover more about the brand and, and look us up. So now that you have a steady flow of customers, are you, is there anything that you've been doing to engage in direct dialogues with your customers to learn more about, to get product feedback, to learn more about who they mm. are, where they hang out, to learn more about your, that, that target customer so you can, you know, obviously make your ad campaigns better and your products better? Yeah, it's a good, it's a great question. I, I, uh, unfortunately not any time recently because we've been so heads down on trying to deal with these growing pains. Yep. and hire new people uh but my new director of marketing sarah and i were just talking about we want to do a facebook uh focus group of like a hundred of our best customers people that we engage with us that we know them they email us they call us um and so we want to add them to like a secret facebook group and then basically just have them comment on product development ideas um preferences things they like to see things they dislike things they like um, so we actually are in the process of doing something very much like that until this point, we've just done Google form surveys to find out color preferences, bed sizes, yeah. uh, you know, well, we do extra deep pockets on our sheets, uh, to fit 20 inch mattresses just because an overwhelming number of people in our initial survey a year and a half ago said, I can't find sheets that fit my thick mattress. It's impossible. Yeah. It's annoying. Um, I, have, I have a thick mattress. Drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you read it, you know, you go on sheet, sheet company websites and it's like, we fit 15 inch mattresses. And it's like, well, I have a 18 inch mattress. Like, what do I do? So yeah. So we, we do, we listen to the customer. We, we do things almost directly as they tell us. I don't have any um, significant attachment. I actually think it's a, a really interesting, both like a, a con and a benefit to me starting this company is that I was not obsessed with betting when I started the company. Now I am. Uh, yeah. But when I started the company, I was totally product agnostic. And so my, my products are strictly defined for whatever is going to sell best, whatever the market's going to resonate with the most. So our top five colors are just ranked in court and according to what people said in their initial survey. Our bed sizes that we launched with, literally just 95% of the market based on the top seven sizes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, avoiding skew proliferation while still hitting 80, 20 market demand is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, of all the marketing activities that you've undertaken so far, is Facebook continuing to be the biggest driver of new customers or have you experimented with Google, Google shopping? Uh, what other things have you done? Or, uh, or which, of, which is the best? Uh, I, uh, Facebook's still the best. Um, Instagram is up there. Also Zuckerberg. Um, I, I, we are now doing more Pinterest advertising. Um, and so we're currently in a learning phase with Pinterest where we're, uh, figuring out what performs and what doesn't, uh, Google branded search terms crush. Obviously, uh, we're also always advertising on, uh, high intent keyword searches. So you pull up the sheets, um, you know, we dominate that, that type of category. Um, and then, uh, we also are doing a few things. Um, we're starting now with some YouTube advertising and then, uh, we just started three new things, podcast sponsorships. Uh, we started doing newsletter sponsorships. Uh, so, uh, if you're familiar with things like the skim, um, mm-hmm. or other similar daily read newsletters in the morning, those convert really well. Uh, and then the third thing is we actually started sponsoring some YouTube creators. Um, and so we always, we find funny YouTubers that we really, really just crack us up mm-hmm. and we just reach out to them, you know, that maybe they have a couple hundred thousand subscribers and we're like, your videos kill us in the office. We'd love to support your work. And they actually will make us ads that are usable in other channels. And then they'll put those ads at the end of their videos. And we see pretty deep recent cost of acquisitions on those not as low as like a Facebook but um combined with the the hundreds of thousands of brand impressions I think it's actually a pretty decent spend how many people do you have in your marketing department to help help you get all this stuff done two (laughs) your director of marketing your director of marketing and you three me my director of marketing and a marketing associate okay um and then I know it's it's crazy we're my, my favorite metric is revenue per head um, but, <laughs> uh, no, we're, we're stretched way too thin. Um, you know, it, now that being said, when I get to go back to my investors and I get to say, Hey, we just made, you know, X hundred thousand dollars this month, um, with five people, uh, our investors are like, <laughs> she, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah. and so, you know, it's like, it's really, it's really, um, it's too much though. I, and my team knows that and, and I know that. And so we've got some job openings out there, head of content marketing, uh, logistics manager, and then probably a full-time copywriter as well. So um, that'll probably bring us to eight or nine by end of year. And then I think that we can hit our next inflection points with 10 people or less. Do you have an affiliate program? We do. We actually just opened up on share a sale um, last week. And so we are going to start doing affiliate marketing. But that being said, I haven't done affiliate marketing before. So it's a little daunting. And I don't know, aside from rejecting all the terrible discount sites, um, you know, you, employing that is going to be, I think, a bit of a challenge. So we do, we do have a PR agency now that's just beginning to reach out for, for Q4 um, holiday gift guides. Okay. Sorry, I was getting a text from my wife who's also trying to, she needs the Zoom account and I told her, don't. That's interrupt. funny, that's funny. If you, uh, by the way, if you have, have any advice on the affiliate program, let me know or, or another podcast number that I should listen to. I would love to, to dive in to someone who's really been there, done that. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I've got one, uh, one friend here in Boise, uh, a fellow by the name of Nathan Berry, who runs a email marketing software company called ConvertClick. And I know that affiliate marketing for him has been big, 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 big. And so he has, um, they basically do two webinars a day every day. So he has one person who's full time. When I spoke to him, one, maybe it's more than that now, full time job is just finding potential affiliates. So that's a salesperson. And then the other person went to broad school for broadcast journalism. So they like talking in front of cameras and they do the two webinars every single day, day after day, after day, after day, after day. Mm-hmm. And that for him has been wildly successful. I would imagine given the number of, you know, lifestyle bloggers that are out there um, who've built, you know, sizable followings um, that it would be pretty successful for you. I think, I think you're right. I think that I got to get, Carl, who's my marketing associate, get him some 
some hours every day flexing that muscle and see what we can pull on it and see if we make sense to hire a full timer. It's a good call. Yeah. I'm I'm learning from you too, Trust. So this is this is very very helpful. Yeah, um, I would I definitely want to keep a dialogue going on going with you and we'll talk about that more later. I do I do kind of one on one masterminds every time I find someone who I think that's a guy I need to keep in touch that, with. There's probably a lot of people from each other. That'd be great. I would love that. Um but yeah, sorry, we've gotten digressed from the We have. <laughs> rabbit hole, rabbit hole, rabbit hole. Come back up. Okay, so uh, do you know what your blended customer, I'm sure you do, you, your I blended do. customer acquisition cost is? I, I know, yeah, I know it by heart. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to say it because our competitors, people, people are starting to get wise to us. And I mean, I've got, I've got Brooklyn and Bowling Branch and Parachute and, um, you know, people breathing down my neck. Um, um, so let me, let me ask I, how, how would disclosing, cause I'm curious if you said, well, it's $74 and 19 cents, how does that actually help them? What, like, why would you be cagey with that number? Because you're not talking about the specific strategy. Mm, the, the biggest thing is that I want them to sweat. So I'll, <laughs> I just, I, I just, I want, I want them to see, and I know through the grapevine, it's a small world. Um, I know what um, some of their ad spend to revenue ratios are. Um, and I know that we're doing a heck of a lot better than some of them. Um, mm -hmm. And so I really like to keep that a little close to the chest. I will say that my target is to always have ad spend to revenue ratio be under 25%. Um, that's our sort of max cap where if it's over 25% ad spend to revenue ratio, I get, uh, I get a little squeamish and we'll figure out what's, what's the driver of that, a bad performance. Um, so, so that's to make sure that, that myself and understand that ratio, you do a hundred grand in revenue in a month. You don't want to spend more than 25,000 on ads. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are you willing to share AOV, LTV, or uh, payback period to how long it takes you to get your money back after you acquire a customer? Oh, we're profitable on the first sale, um, and we're and we're we have a um, almost. I can't. I'm trying to think of which numbers I can divulge. Our our AOV is like you know 150 bucks. Happy, I'm happy to to share that. I mean, you know, a hundred dollar average item price, 1.5. Items yep. per order, generally yep. speaking. Um, you know the the LTV uh, to CAC ratio for us on the first order is uh, uh, almost two <laughs> x, um, and then we we try to get that to three x or higher with repeat purchase by uh, repeat purchases. Um, right. I think we're well we're well over that number right now, and so that's that's I think decent enough detail. I, I would say that like, I don't like to be like a lot of other startups are like, Oh yeah, we'll acquire the customer and then we'll, you know, upsell them on this other stuff and make our money back over time. We can't, we can't really do that. I assume that the first sale will be the last sale for every customer. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that's accurate. In fact, I know that's not accurate. I know what our repeat buy rates are and I know what percentage of our business it is. Um, but I think that it is, uh, important for me to assume that that first sale will be the last sale and it makes it very, it, it forces us to be profitable on that first sale. And I think that that is a, a brilliant strategy. You know, yesterday or two days ago, I interviewed the CEO of a software company uh, for another podcast that I'm launching because I have a software company. And he was talking about how, you know, he hasn't raised any money and he's got competitors that have raised north of $300 million and they still aren't profitable. It's because crazy. they're focused on vanity metrics. They're, they're running, they're running around like drunken sailors and they're spending other people's money. So mm -hmm. there's not that sense of accountability. Uh, I think that there is when you've got a lot of your own money and now he's, you know, he's put the time and the effort into bootstrapping his business. And as a result, he now has like you a profitable company that he's got total control of still. Yeah. And, and I think it's interesting that, um, you know, I see this all the time with startups that raise so much money is that they just, they just, it, it's, it changes the way you think. It changes your entire approach to your marketing. Yeah. You, it becomes more about aggression and, and about uh, sales at all costs. Yeah. You, that makes you, 
that makes you produce products faster and potentially shoddier. It makes you hire a large customer service team, which let's be real when you're hiring a lot of people to do customer service, you're going to hire a lot of people that are not very talented because you need to fill up people yeah. that are answering emails and phone calls all day. Yeah. And so what ends up happening is you end up having higher initial marketing costs, but worse products and a worse customer experience on the back end because you grew too fast and you grew for the wrong reasons. And so I think that, I think that it changes your entire approach. And, um, you know, I think that philosophically, like, I think more people should be focused on how can we make money on the first sale from day one? And I saw this great article in the New York Times the other day. It said, um, the new mantra in Silicon Valley, making a profit is now sexy. And I was like, what a concept. Like, what? <laughs> how, many, how many failed IPOs did it take um, before they figure that Thousands. one out? Thousands. So. All right. We're, yeah. We are running out of time. So we're, I'm only going to ask you, get to ask you one question around people and processes. Um, and that is this. How important or how much effort have you put in so far into creating documented business processes for all the stuff that you guys do? Oh God, what a great question. Um, if I can be completely honest, uh, very little. Um, we have started documenting return processes, uh, what to do in certain customer interaction scenarios, mostly on the customer service side. My, my CS rep, Emily, is fantastic, and uh, I could not do this without her. And she's really done a great job of uh, documenting a lot of the most difficult interactions that she has so that way other people can, can cover that when she's out mm -hmm. or when we expand and hire new people. Um, on the marketing side, we document all of our numbers, all of our numerical data, so that way we can look historically, literally day by day, for the last 400 plus days. Yeah, but that's not a process. Daily you're just that's you're not storing, a process, but you're that, storing important data, it, which is, I get it. But it helps me strategically to think about what, what processes I need to do, what I used to do. I make notes in the data and I say, we were doing this at this time and we changed yeah. this at this date. And that's able to help me see swings and directional swings. Um, but no, other than that, we don't do a lot of documentation. And I want to change that. I think one of, if I can be a little introspective, I think at Bridgewater, there was so much documentation when I began my career and I was literally just writing what they called machines. I was like writing machines and I like, I hated that so much. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that's influenced me to shy away from that and be a little more from the hip. Yeah. Um, but it, it doesn't scale. So no, it does not. Yeah. Yeah, you got document. Yeah, no, it does not. All right, so we we are out of time for this episode. The company is Sheets and Giggles. The founder is Colin McIntosh, who is one of the brightest guys I have ever interviewed on my show in terms of knowing his numbers. So if you're an e-commerce entrepreneur, I suggest you listen to this episode twice at least. So Colin, thank you so much for uh, being on the show. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Trent. This was super fun and um, I'm looking forward to uh, speaking again sometime in the future.